Okay, hi everybody. So welcome to the latest installment of the Aldebaran Recruiting Meet a Business Influencer video series. I'm here today with Aaron Keith. He is the CEO and founder of Ascension Programs, which is a business consulting programs company. Um, Aaron and I, Aaron's one of my best friends, um, and I love Aaron to death. Uh, and so I'm really happy to be here with Aaron today because I get to hang out with him. But Aaron's also an incredible incredible mind in the business community. I mean, you've worked with some of the biggest real estate companies in the country. You've, he's, he's been on TV as a real estate consultant, as a um, uh, business consultant. Um, he's worked with many, many large programs, I know, locally, nationally, mm -hmm. all around. So um, we're going to get to have some cool conversations with Aaron today about um, some of his insight into what makes some businesses, but not just businesses, but departments as well, too. I know many of you watching are department heads, you know, your directors, your VPs of certain departments, and um, we're going to look into some insight about how to get the most out of your, your department or your company. So thanks for being here, Aaron. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good. It's great. Yeah, it's excited. good to see you. It's good to see you. Um, okay, so but like, like we like to start off with these, we want to learn a little bit about Aaron as well, too. So, you know, Aaron, Aaron, is, Aaron has a pretty interesting story about how we got into owning a business and became an entrepreneur and then ended up becoming a business coach. Aaron's owned several other businesses before. So tell us a little bit, you know, about your story of getting into business and sure. how that started. Yeah. So I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've uh, built and sold uh, other companies. I started my first company when I was 19 years old. Uh, it was a medical massage and physical therapy company. And at uh, 21, um, I hired a business coach, and that gentleman helped me build that first company up. And it was just an absolutely incredible process. Yeah, that's cool. And I'd either be dead or in jail if it wasn't for my first business coach. Like, that's so cool. He was a mentor, a father figure, uh, more than just a general business coach. And at 24, my first business was as big as I wanted it to be. And actually, it was literally right down the street here on, on <laughs> Ivy. And uh, I told him that someday I'd like to be a business coach and do what he did for me for mm -hmm. other people. Mm -hmm. And so he agreed to train me. So I started coaching at 24, ran the, the first uh, company still simultaneously. And at 26, I sold off the first company and started coaching full time. The so, massage company, right? Yeah, the yeah. massage company. So mm -hmm. I'll be 40 here in May. So I've been coaching for a little while. Oh, great, by the way. Well, thank you. <laughs> I've been coaching for a little while here. And you know, coaching is a self-expression for me. Um, it's not just... I like the information, the business, the, the psychology, the, the brain science behind it. I love the difference and the impact that it makes. Yeah. I couldn't think of anything more rewarding to do. Yeah, that is cool. Yeah, and I know I know many people that you've worked with personally that have made a difference with. You've, you know, I feel so fortunate to be like a good friend of you. I get to, I'm picking your brain constantly all the time, you know, and I learn so much from Aaron. So it's, it's a cool story. I mean, I don't know many people that had a business coach and then grew their business and then said, you know what? I've had such a difference made with me, I want to contribute that to other people as well. And you've been doing that for how many years now? Um, over 15. Over 15, over 15 years, years yeah. yeah. And then uh, about four years ago, I started another company. Um, I'm involved in a medical company. And so that company runs very much without me. I'm just involved about you know one day a week or half a day a week. It really runs itself. And uh, I'm looking actually for the next business I'm gonna build. Very cool, Yeah. very cool, very cool. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you know, Aaron has so much to offer from a business coaching perspective. And of course, we'll have all of Aaron's contact information and his website and everything in the description for the video. So you can check out and learn more about Aaron and contact him if you want to. Um, so there's a couple things that I want to talk about with you. Um, so we were talking about this a little bit before we started recording here. The A lot of what you do is a balance, right? Between a lot of the coaching you do with your clients is coaching them in the balance between the actual systems to run their business. Right. And that could be a business, right? Or really a business unit within yeah. a company, right? Correct. Because a business unit is like a small business within a business, teams, right? Okay, absolutely. Whether it's a sales department. team, a marketing department, mm -hmm. whatever that might be. There's the systems that have that run and have that, you know, be effective and results producing. Correct. And, but the systems don't just act on their own. There's the mindset component of it. Correct. And that mindset component tends to be the more underdeveloped for most businesses and businesses units, right? right. Well, you'd say, yeah. And the mindset kind of provides like the framework or even the context for the systems in a lot of ways. It so does. the mindset kind of supports that. So talk to us a little bit more about mindset and, you know, I'm interested in what you have to say about mindset in terms of advice for others. And I'm also interested your mindset, like what drives you and where, how does that fit in all this? So it's kind sure. of like two things. So yeah. yeah, so I'll start with me because I, I actually think it translates over into where I think people should be looking for their uh, piece of their mindset. Yeah. For me, um, I, like I said, I'll be 40 here very shortly. My, my personal goal is to be financially free by 45. Mm -hmm. So my mantra has been for many years, 40, mm -hmm. 40, you know, 40, 45 financial freedom. Yeah. And 
that's always been my driver. So from that context, that viewpoint, I've been looking at all the different ways and all different things in my life that need to be set up so that can actually happen, mm -hmm. right? Whether I hit that goal or not, we'll see, but it's, it's that thing that pulls me forward. Yeah. So um, the first thing I really think people need to understand is what is that thing that pulls you forward? For, the, for me, I'll use my example, being financially free at 45 is very authentic to me. It's something that's very passionate to me. It, it doesn't en engage my ego. It's not engaging um, society. It's really a personal thing because of the, the philanthropic things I want to go spend my time mm -hmm. doing. So there's a, there's a lot back there that I get access to by, by not having to work so much and spending my time doing those philanthropic yeah. things. Yeah. So authenticity, I think, is a very important thing for people to understand. Yeah. That goal needs to be authentic. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think it's great when it's fear-based. Mm -hmm. or when yeah. it's ego-based. Yeah. Because there's different kinds of motivation, right? Totally. Paying your rent is a fear-based motivation that yeah, right. serves you a purpose in that moment, short-term. It's a very good short-term motivator. But if you want longevity out of your motivation, authentic motivation matters. Yeah, and I think that's a mistake. I mean, I see that a lot with salespeople. I've been in that pitfall myself as well too, where your main driver is something survival-based, right? Like, mm -hmm. I gotta pay my bills, you know? We were talking with, uh, in a previous episode, we've talked with Michelle Weinstein about how any entrepreneur or business owner is a is essentially a 24-7, 100% commission only salesperson, Correct. right? Mm -hmm. But it's not enough just to be driven by what you're saying, like having having just a survival mechanism be the driver. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, so once you can create for yourself what you feel like that heartfelt or very authentic motivation is, putting it up so it's very visual for you. You gotta put structure around that. That can't mm -hmm. live in your head. Yeah. That has to be up on the wall. You have to have reminders. You need to have a, right. occasions in your calendar where you're revisiting that and checking in on that and measuring how you're doing against that. Those yeah. kind of structures and accountability is what actually has that translate into results. Yeah. Right? Creating your big why, that's great, right? Right. But if there's no structures, no accountability to it, eventually it's just going to fizzle out. Right, because then it's just all hook, kind of hopes and dreams and happy thoughts, Which, right? Yeah, wish, wishful yeah. thinking. Wishful thinking. And then, you know, when you start to, let's take a sales team, for example. Um, a lot of people, you know, probably listen to this or, or in sales to some degree or another. You want your sales goal to have a, a needs, needs to be tethered over to a why. Mm -hmm. Whether it's your big why or something that's definitely out in the future pulling you forward. Mm -hmm. And when, when any of us really go for it, right? We, we stretch ourselves, that's the opportunity that we tap into what's right. in there, right. right? I think one of the best ways for all of us that we've all seen before in the past, as an example, is the Olympics. Mm -hmm. You watch people who've never done this in their entire life. They've, they've been training for this moment. Yeah. And in that moment, they beat not only the world record, right. but their own record. Right. That's never ever happened on this earth before right. because of what they're committed to yeah. and they even surprise themselves. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, so setting that context, that framework, matters. Right, and I mean, I think to ride on that example of the Olympics, nobody in the Olympics, and I think the Olympics are a good example of people that are interested in high performance, right? And I think if you're, if you're listening to this, this, this interview, or you're watching this interview, and I know anybody that's really in, in, a, in a department head or a business owner somewhere is interested in high performance, I mean, yeah. that's what we're interested in, right? Yeah. At the end of the day, it's performing, it's producing results. Right. Um, Anybody who's really, really interested in performance has a big why. Correct. You know, like anybody in the Olympics has a big why. I mean, they want to be the champion. They want to be the best in the world. And that's what drives them. It's not go to practice and whatever. It's, it's it, There's definitely a big why there. So I, I, I just kind of connected that in that. Which is yeah, cool. and then to, to keep pulling that forward, put structure to it. So the mindset component, just so we can be super clear, the mindset component is your why, your motivator, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Your authentic, heartfelt motivation. Yeah. Then we have structure. There's all kinds of structure that matters, depending on where we want to take the conversation. Right. Your calendar is one of the largest pieces of structure that we all should be using mm -hmm. that makes a difference totally. for us. Totally, totally agree with you, yeah. I mean, I know I live, if it's not in my calendar, it's not gonna happen. It's just, it's just a fantasy if it's not in my calendar. Yeah. We yeah. always say if it, doesn't, if it matters to you, it's in your calendar somewhere. Yeah, love that, exactly. Cool, cool, cool. So what, and you spoke to it a little bit, I think earlier when you were talking about why you got into coaching, but tell us a little bit more about and you, you know, you spoke about your mindset. You know, your big goal is the financial freedom by forty-five. What are, what are some other of your passions or like inspirations that really keep you going every day, or really drive you that you connect yourself to? Um, my personal life also matters. I believe balance in life is hugely important. I don't think balance is a is a fluffy word. I think balance has grit. 
and balance in this day and age is not an easy thing because everyone's so connected. Yeah. So rock climbing, snowboarding, uh, training, these are things that I, I'm going rock climbing tonight. Yeah. I, like having those things in your life that are personal passions. Yeah. I think make you better at work. Yeah. Totally. Because when you when everything that you're about is your work, eventually it will erode your balance. Mm. That that balance erodes your mental, emotional, and physical capacity. Mm -hmm. There's three different kinds of capacity, mental, emotional, and physical. Mm -hmm. And people can get diminished on either one mm -hmm. or all or multiple of those levels. Yeah. Having things outside that fuel you, that bring you juice and fill your batteries in those mm -hmm. apartments really makes a huge difference. Yeah, yeah, gotcha, that's great. And I, I think, you know, for, for all the years that I've known you, you, you are very good at balancing that. And one of the things I've noticed that Aaron does is I'll, I'll, I notice when you notice you get unbalanced. Yes. Like you'll you'll work too much, and then you'll be like, oh, and you'll balance, and you'll 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 correct it, which is really cool, right? I don't see that. I, most people I know start to work too much, and then that never stops. <laughs> and that's how they've been for right. the past ten years, right? right. Um, I think I'm I'm partially that way too. I should talk to you about. Uh, actually, I do want to talk to you about some stuff when we're done here. But so, and uh, here's something yeah. that's interesting. Like I just yeah. got this in in uh, hearing this conversation land. If you're interested in high performance you really need to understand or want to understand what balance is and mm -hmm. how balance impacts capacity, right? The more mental, emotional, physical capacity one has, mm -hmm. the higher producer they become. Yeah, that makes sense. So if your performance is diminishing, normally in a conversation I could figure out in, a, in talking to someone mm -hmm. where their capacity, mentally, emotionally, mm -hmm. and or physically, has been diminished mm -hmm. and how balance has been removed. And by mm -hmm. adding balance, their mental, emotional, physical capacity starts to increase. Right. Totally As that sense. increases, their performance goes hard. Yeah. I have the, uh, the privilege and honor of coaching several celebrities. Uh, some of them are NBA players. Some of them are TV uh, stars. And watching their schedule, their grit. I mean, they are at the gym at right. 4.30 in the morning. Right. They're putting in 14, 16-hour days, six, seven days a week. Right. And... Their mental, emotional, physical capacity is so on point. Interesting, even with that workload. Yeah, because they also, when they do check out, they check out. Right. And they've found the things that fill their tanks. And that's different mm. for everybody. Mm. That's pretty cool. Yeah, because I think a lot of us think, what does balance mean? Okay, that means I can only work seven hours a day or something like that. And I like what you're pointing to where Balance isn't a number per se. It's going to be different for each person. Absolutely. And high performers, when you're really interested in high performance, can pack a lot into a day, milk the most out of a day, out of a week, and yeah. still achieve and attain balance. Because they, they know their personal formula. Right. right yeah. like I, I work easy 12 hour days, Monday through Friday, but on weekends I do zero work. I, right. have, I have no, he, he knows I yeah. have no email on my phone, my clients don't have my cell phone number. I'm literally on balance mode mm -hmm. for a couple mm -hmm. days. Yeah, yeah, I, I do that with weekends as well too, mm -hmm. which I think is yeah, that's cool. All right, great. So, um, so I wanted to transition that a little bit into the other part of the conversation that we were talking that we were talking about earlier, right? So, and this ties into we wanted to talk a little bit. I know many of you out there were talking to the same people, right? You're a department head, you're a business owner, you're you're a you're you're someone who's hiring, you, if or you're hoping to be hiring soon, right? You're hoping that you're in a position where your company and your say, your your customer base, your client base is growing and you're gonna need more people on your team, you're scaling, you're growing your business. So we were talking about how, and it was funny, I've, I think I read, I read an article about it earlier, I've been reading about it all the time, um, their culture is becoming more and more important, right? Yeah. When, with, with hiring. Exactly. And we work with clients you know, on a regular basis, that's all we do here at All Devron is we find talent for our clients, right? And we talk about, and our clients are so interested in, we gotta have the right cultural fit for my team. I gotta have the right personality right. fit for the team. And ever, that's just as priority A for everybody because you can teach someone's skills, but you can't necessarily teach someone's culture. personality or their culture, yeah. right? right? So what's really interesting about that is that it's, it's becoming more, it always has been, but it's becoming more and more and more the most important thing to hire for, and it's the hardest thing to interview for. Yeah. And it's the hardest thing also, I think, for many, com many companies, and in fact, we have candidates that have complained about that they go interview somewhere and they go, I can't tell what their culture is. Yeah. Their culture is really undefined. I don't right. know if I'm gonna fit in there or not, right? right? And so this is something that you you talk to clients about, right? Yeah, so I'm, I'll jump around a little bit on this conversation there's a lot of different legs that we can kind of jump onto. Um, I wanna use my medical company as an example here. What we've done, which is a bit unique, 
is you know when you when you get a job most people sign an employment agreement and yeah. a lot of times they'll sign their job description right well we've added a unique component to that is we actually attach our our ethos our culture yeah. as an addendum to the job description uh, and the employment agreement That's so, so cool. for us not only do our employees sign the employment agreement the job description but our company culture gets signed so the people are actually agreeing to that because for us the culture is just as much as part of the job as anything else mm -hmm. and Again, to add another piece of uh, unique chunk to this, we took our company culture and we've expanded on it. So this is just my belief. My belief is that, and this is, this is how the document's laid out. The top of my uh, company culture has my core values, mission statement, and our culture statement. Like mm -hmm. We actually have defined our culture. Right. That's page one. Page two is the rules, boundaries, and guidelines that we all have to agree to follow for that culture to even exist. Yeah. And then the last page is our customer experience. Because we believe, and I believe, that the customer experience can't actually be fulfilled on if the company culture is missing. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So to us, all of that has to be signed and yeah. agreed on, yeah. and it makes a tremendous difference. Yeah. Very and cool. we also have it, it's um, as another structure, A, it's, it's up in the office, like mm -hmm. it's present, people can visually see it in the break room. And two, as our meeting agendas, we do weekly meetings and monthly meetings, it's actually one of the standing line items on our meeting agenda to discuss culture. Yeah. And actually see where's it showing up and acknowledge those people. It's great. And if it's missing somewhere, how do we impact that? Yeah. So if somebody is interviewing at your company, they get to see these documents. During right? the interview. During the interview, right? Yeah. 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 Before yeah. they make it to the end, right. on our first interview, we bring up that our culture here is, is, is very well protected. Mm -hmm. we, we, we covet our culture. Yeah, yeah. And so we describe our culture so as they're going through our process, they're aware and we're aware. And so you know, we do a working interview like many companies do. Yeah. And that's especially an opportunity to see how well are they exuding that thing totally. that we told them is so critically that's important. That's so good. That's so good. So it's like there's two things that you're saying that I think are so important, right? Because the trick here in a lot of ways is one, how do you interview for culture? But two, before you even start interviewing for culture, you gotta have a culture that's defined, right? Have so to. one, have in place what you gotta have in place to have a defined culture, like a palpable culture. Absolutely. And not just palpable, like people feel it, but palpable, they feel it, and here, check it out, this is what it is. Yeah. You know, does this align with you? Discuss it. Right? Because you don't wanna hire someone. I think a lot of times too, we see people go to get jobs somewhere and they want to act the way they think the interviewer or the company wants them to act so they can get the job. Right. But then what happens is you get too many people that get jobs somewhere because they were pretending they're in the interview or something like that. Maybe it's I'm not the right guy. cultural authentic fit, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, we always tell people it's an interview both ways, right? When you're so, going somewhere, you got to be really gauging. Is this the right move for me? Mm -hmm. You know, our one of our, our main mission with Aldebaran is to create a world where people love what they do. Right. Because there's too many people out there that are spending time at work, they don't love what they do. They don't even like what they do, let alone love it. Right. And so that's a big thing for us is making those right matches with our clients. That's something that I think makes us unique as a recruiting firm is we actually care about making those those right connections. You know, we're mission driven mm -hmm. in that way. But what you're pointing to is you've got to have a culture and then interview for it. Right. Write people through the gamut. Show them what it is, let them see for themselves, but also the working interview is so important because think, yeah. everybody, I think every company should do some, either it's a working interview or some sort of test. Technical stuff, easy to test for. Do, if, you have, if you're a technical, if you're running a technical kind of role or hiring for a technical role, just do tests for it. Or, or do a working interview or have yep. someone do a project, a case study, something like that. Something Correct. that shows how they work. Don't be, don't wait for day one and day two to see how this person works. Yeah. No, you know, set yourself up for surprise that right. way, um, both culturally and, and with technical stuff. Another structure that companies can put in, this is very much speaking to the CEO of the department head, yeah. is every year we, as business owners and department heads, we should be doing annual planning of some kind. Yeah, that's good. Um, one of the things that needs to be on everybody's annual planning checklist is a review of culture. Culture is not something you chisel in stone. Culture is something that needs to be fluid, because as life evolves, mm -hmm. as your company evolves, yeah. as your employee stack evolves, you want them to weigh in on that. So a lot of times, I created the framework of our culture right. and our ethos. And then we sat down with the staff and had them weigh in. Yeah, right. And then together we we crystallized it. Totally. And every year you need to bring that back out and rehab that discussion. Totally. That's that so way great. they buy into it. It's not yes. your culture, yes. it's our culture. Absolutely, right? I mean it's a we is I mean a we is and we see that more and more as you know, I'm seeing research about what, what drives the millennial generation. You know, there's so many people something. complaining about 
I don't know how to keep millennials on my team. Well, so you have it yeah. involved as a manager. And millennials yeah. aren't driven by the same thing that baby boomers were driven or even Gen right. Xers are driven by. Right. Millennials are driven by, like you said, being a part of something, feeling like something. they're making a difference with something. And that's, that's... They want to be engaged with you. Yeah. They want to exactly. be engaged they in the process. Be yeah. Very important. They want to be engaged yeah. in the process. Yeah. Very cool. Well, Aaron, you know, time flies, right? Hey, but I think we covered some good stuff here. Yeah. Thanks so much for being here with us. So again, everybody, this is Aaron. Aaron's company is called Ascension Programs. It's a business coaching and consulting firm. We'll have his info in the description. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you all later. Bye, guys. Bye.